Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Well, welcome to Otaku Generation. Generation. Next generation radio for otaku. Our podcast brings all the otaku to the yard. Welcome to show 1005. Hi, hello, everyone. I am Alan. I am Matt. And I am Paul. Yeah, so we don't have any uh, uh, sweeper music for What's Free yeah. anymore, so we'll just jump right into it. So what did I do this week uh, since the last recording? I coughed a lot. I, I got some sleep, a fair amount, enough to start actually healing. What else? I recorded a, a polymatic with John for September, so we'll put that out whenever he puts it out. I don't know if I mentioned but i i definitely finished a one through and i watched all of discovery um uh, well that's not true i didn't star trek discovery you mean? yeah i just i felt the need for some i needed some sci-fi or something mm-hmm. so i went through and i watched all of it i think i have like the last season i have a few more episodes to watch before i'm completely done the last season is not as solid as it it's a, as it could have been as i probably mentioned to you paul i didn't hate it as much as it didn't feel as, I, I guess it's because I knew what to expect. And based on mm-hmm. knowing what yeah. to expect, I knew what the BS was going to happen when it was going to happen. It didn't bother me as much. In fact, they had wrote a lot of the stuff where they were going to really should have jumped the shark in pretty early on. So when you know what you're expecting, you you know what the indicators they were telling you ahead of time that this is what they were going to be doing. So did you rewatch the whole thing or just the early seasons? No, the, all all the way from season Ooh, one, I... all the way up to almost on season five. I think I needed a little, little break on that. Um, then I flipped over to sci-fi series called Dark Matter. That was pretty limited. So hmm. I'm just finishing up season one. Um, I kind of enjoyed it. It was its own thing. Um, but yeah, so that was it. That's kind of... I think all that I did that's worth worth mentioning. What about you, Matt? Uh, well, I've been dealing with uh, with real life issues, unfortunately. So since before we started the uh, the season impressions, lo these many moons ago, the only interesting thing I've done lately has been watching the new uh, Deadpool movie, which I enjoyed pretty well. Tickled one of my pet peeves about the Marvel Cinematic Universe that you kind of had to have watched loki and the whole sacred timeline agency thing to understand the setting that that it took place in alternate timelines and multiverses are a horrible horrible tally storytelling crutch i think marvel has has wandered down the wrong path with exploring these ideas too much i mean it's it's fine if you have time travel in a show like doctor who where they basically have this rule that you never go the same place twice. You never go to the same time twice. You're just sort of using time and space travel as an excuse to, to get you to novel, interesting settings in the Marvel cinematic universe. And to a lesser extent, Terminator sequels, everybody's trying to make time travel or multiverse theory Part of the plot, you need a really big think about the nature of time and reality and manipulating them to make these things significant major plot points. But, you know, I haven't seen the new Deadpool movie yet. I was a reasonable uh, fan of the previous ones. Um, But, you know, it seems like they wouldn't have needed to go the alternate universes route. It would have been better if they'd, like, taken it totally meta. Mm-hmm. Right, and just you know, leaned into the hey, this is a Deadpool movie. Look, we're bringing in the the X Men, you know, because that really leans into the Deadpool as a character, keeps it keeps it weird in its way. Yeah, and I, I think that was like the big strength of the original Deadpool movie, mm. and even of the second one, it was that we weren't saving the world. It was this is Deadpool's life or Wade's life. He's out for 
personal revenge. That's the scope of it. That's the stakes of it. I thought it was kind of interesting that the cable showed up and in the second movie and juggernaut and they they had this kind of larger plot where deadpool was actually trying to do something heroic as opposed to just like settling personal business and then in this third movie we've got like you know 27 different wolverines and timeline management authority which Mm -hmm. is just as a concept all i can think is like that one my little ponies episode (laughs) where twilight sparkle is trying to organize the the basically unorganizable ponies to clear away the snow of winter and warm equestria up so that spring can begin and that's just what the time authority seems to me is like making a whole lot of extra effort to to manage something which doesn't need to you know be managed or even exist in the first place so as i said i haven't seen it but that's giving me sort of rick and morty uh, i am very deep vibes but taken like seriously like done straight so you know it's funny you mentioned that because actually the big thing i was watching this past week was doctor who which i haven't checked in on in a long time oh really and what what are you watching so I actually picked it up from the beginning of New Who. So, uh-huh. oh, um, so Christopher, like, Christopher Eccleston. Eccleston. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's been a long time. So, like, I haven't watched this since it was actually airing, which is, when you look at it, like a horrifying amount of time ago <laughs> at this point. I mean, it's just, like, horrifying. And so, I, you know, I, I was watching... I was watching Doctor Who pretty regularly up until the Peter Capaldi episodes. And that's about the time I fell off because there was a lot of other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I do want to to check those out, but I figured I'd like, okay, let's go back and check out season one. And, you know, I got to say, it holds up pretty damn well. Yeah, I I was, was, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was, I was kind of disappointed when Christopher Eccleston, um, decided to leave the show after only one season because I thought he was doing a a pretty good job reestablishing the character and and like taking it in an interesting direction. I agree with you. I thought he was doing a pretty good job and uh, I think he you know, didn't want to be typecast as a Doctor Who character. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that was his mm-hmm. big thing, which irony is David Tennant and Matt Smith have been fine outside of Who. So mm. um, David Tennant did what? Uh, three seasons? I think they did three seasons each, right? So, uh, yeah, that I don't sounds think anybody's about right. done more than three seasons as of the, the new series. Tennant and that, Smith certainly correct? did a fair amount. Um, I don't know. Eccleston only did the one with Billy Piper. Yeah. Um, Which was a pity, really. I think it was, what, Tennant next? Then um, Smith. Capaldi had at least two seasons, as did Whitaker. And then um, Capaldi, and then whoever the female one was, and whoever that's, is now. That's Jodie Whittaker, yeah. Oh, okay, mm, yeah. Right, right. So I didn't, I didn't watch any of her stuff. I, I fell off on Capaldi too. Who was never my, really my thing. Really, so, I kind of liked him. I liked his grouchy portrayal. <laughs> no, I just meant general, generally, Doctor Who is was never my thing. Oh, oh, oh. So, you know, I mean, it's it's also a hard sell what they're doing when you swap out the lead actor for mm. someone who is, you know, in universe meant to be completely different. And, you know, you spend a lot of time. Uh, they try to tell, you know, at least uh, in the current uh, iteration, you know, fairly emotional storylines with these characters. You establish the attachment to them and then they break that attachment. Right. Mm. So every few years you have to. You know, just like the companions who are along with the doctor at the time, you have to, you know, come to terms with the new doctor. And that could be that could be a hard, a hard sell sometimes, even if even if the actor is doing a perfectly fine job. So the actor changes, mm. the companion changes or companions, I guess. it's Well, usually they try and have companions sort of like retain over the overlap between an old doctor mm. and a new one. They always voice the voice a new set of people in or a new one yeah. in after a certain point. Um, obviously, I did not like Donna. Never like Donna. <laughs> really? Drive me nuts. You didn't like Donna Noble? No, I just she oh, irritated I thought, me so I much. I thought she was kind of like a nice meta companion concept because usually everybody's like very starry eyed and enamored by the doctor and the charisma and the whole 
traveling through time and space and donna is just like very very down to earth and is like she doesn't she doesn't want to deal with with any no i found her nonsensical annoying. bullshit yeah. she's she's very practical um the, so, the, the so, so. point i was going with was that the what was consistent is the story they always had their weird episode they had their weird creative episode they always had plenty of horror weird episodes those are always fairly consistent despite the doctor and the companions being swapped out that was what the point that i was going for originally sorry sorry paul i didn't mean to oh no no that's that, that's fine i mean it's interesting i i appreciate you know and, you know going back i appreciate how they're clearly right from out the gate trying new things with this series you know, you know they've they've mm -hmm. shake, uh, they've shaken up all of the uh, all of the history, all the Gallifrey, all the Time Lord stuff from the uh, from the original uh, the original Who series, and you know they 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 reintroduce it a little bit over time, but you know in a totally transformed. So you've got the time war, you know, the time war stuff, mm -hmm. but you know like when the Daleks come back, they actually do succeed in making the Daleks uh, both menacing and pathetic. <laughs> and, and and that's 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 great. I mean, that's a real uh, a real heart to at least that first season. I think. Yeah, so. I, I'm the thing about Daleks is if you take them way too seriously, they're very nasty. Um, they're they're basically little mutant blobs who are bred to do nothing but hate and kill in largely invulnerable personal tanks. And if you take that too seriously, that's just awful. So you you need to have that that sort of like contrasting dimension to their characterization so that you can actually have the doctor just show up and uh, be be witty and and glib with them for a little bit before they they start, you know, just disintegrating people because, they're tired of waiting around. It, it's interesting, though. In this one, it's that the Doctor truly hates the Daleks in that first oh, season. Oh, yeah. And that is, I think, a, a really interesting aspect of, you know, season one and how that's portrayed. And, you know, but, the, you know, as you say, then there's that humorous moment, you know, in that reintroduction episode where, you know, the Dalek is foiled by the stairs and then it starts floating. Right. So, you know, they're in dialogue with the entire history of the Doctor mm. Who series at that point. Oh, yeah. Well, it's sort of like Nausicaa's tan pants, yeah. you know, Daleks being thwarted by staircases. Yeah. And so, I mean, like a lot of the writing is kind of sucky. I mean, like if you look too hard at all of the, the Mickey stuff or the way, you know, uh, Bob, uh, Rose's mother and Mickey are treating her just like totally disregarding any personal interests she has. You know, it doesn't <laughs> go that deep. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's good entertainment. I think it holds up really well. Um, I think I actually enjoyed it a little more this time through than I did the first time I watched it. Uh, I, will, um, I will give them credit for having some creative creatively written episodes right the angels for example oh yeah wasn't that a cool concept they every once in a while they had a nugget but like i said there are just a couple things that they did really well and like the angels for example that was just like awesome and horrifying at its, its own way that i will give credit for that there were some really good creative writing but i will say i kind of agree with you paul most of the time for me the writing was just bad so, so I, I finished up uh, yesterday actually with uh, the Christmas Invasion, which is the uh, the special introducing uh, the David Tennant as the new the new uh, the new Doctor. And you know, again, that holds up pretty well. Um, for my memory is, I really enjoyed Tennant as a as doc, as the Doctor, and I liked him more than Eccleston. But you know, once again, as I said, you know, it's like whiplash coming off of you know a pretty good performance and now he has to step in fill those shoes uh, mm. but also you know as he's clearly doing in that special trying to feel out what kind of doctor who is he going to be and you know it's kind of good they're hanging the lampshade on that as he is in like the dress-up room in the TARDIS you know, like <laughs> trying on different outfits from this big rack figuring out you know what his costume is gonna be so, mm, yeah. so so I mean the, the meta aspects pretty uh, pretty enjoyable so as long as you don't take it too seriously 
Um, so I'm looking forward to watching some uh, second season uh, Doctor Who. Check out the Cybermen, who I seem to recall were one of the the, the big enemies. Can't remember much else. I don't think we, I don't think the angels are until series three, if I recall. So. Mm, yeah, although they actually do have uh, uh, a reprise in a later episode, one of the River Song episodes, um, in mm. fact, which I thought was. Uh, kind of a nice callback um yeah. they they like have them show up again and even expand their lore a little bit more so um, yes yeah so well, i guess that's um i mean we've certainly talked about dr who plenty in the history of this show but you know we circle around <laughs> this stuff and you know and again you know 15 20 years later it's interesting to sort of swing back again and see see how 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 the show has changed relative to to us because it's static while while we and the world move on so the other thing i will talk about a video game and this is an oldish video game as well this is the 2015 hitman video game this is a series that's been around for a long time since what is it code name 47 back on the original xbox i not I, I was never really much into this series i tried it at various points and kind of bounced off of it mm -hmm. the, the 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 big concept behind this series should you be somehow unfamiliar with it is you are a sort of uh, genetically crafted perfect hitman with an obscure uh, origin. Uh, you are bald, you have a barcode tattooed on the back of your head, and you execute people in either the most perfect way possible or in extremely messy ways. I played Hitman for, I think, roughly 18 hours straight. <laughs> What doesn't work about Hitman is if you are trying to just get through it. Uh, you know, when Agent 47 is walking around, he walks, right? He's not running. <laughs> you're not sprinting. If you, you know, hit the run button, you're moving at like a, a slow jog. But that doesn't fit the mood of the game. And like if you're waiting for somebody to show up in a certain place, you know, you got to wait. You got to just stand there, bud, uh -huh. and, you know, like blend in and, you know, like sit at the table, you know, with the blend but in button hit, uh, hit. So you're having a drink or you're behind the bar with the poison drink in front of you waiting for, you know, your target to come along, drink it, you know, and, and then get an upset stomach from the rat poison so you can follow him into the bathroom, sidestep his, his guard and drown him in the toilet right <laughs> so uh you you have to take the time to get into the speed of this game and you know i could kind of feel that previously but it, it, this time i did not feel the need to rush through it. it it sounds like it has unrealized depths to it that i was not aware of before yeah this is why, like, I if there's something that's really well regarded that I just do not get, every so often I like to go back and check it out and say, do I get it now? Because, mm. you know, when you hit that point, you know, if there's a, a band uh, that, you know, for, you know, 25 years, you're like, eh, whatever, you know, I, that's not the kind of thing I like. But all of a sudden, you know, you manage to listen to that album that pushes you over the edge. Then you've got, you know, a dozen albums from their history all of a sudden you know your world has expanded and that's kind of where i'm at with hitman i get it right i get why this game has been so highly regarded and it's always gonna be that now this is going to be you know a world a space i can go back into and appreciate you know just the the, the beautiful careful design that's gone into it. And mm. let's face it, I'm also only just over a third of the way through the, the main levels. So I still have plenty, plenty to play for, for, you know, just this first time through. So I'm taking my time and enjoying it. That sounds awesome. Um, mm. Why don't we talk about the topic for this week? Let's do it. Oh, that's right. We have a topic this week, don't we? <laughs> How about that? Okay. Uh, this week's topic is a pair of hour long movies um called kura yukuba and kura meku kagari um they're both directed by da, 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 da. 
Uh, so I believe you are looking for the name of, of uh, Shigeyoshi Tsukahara, a first-time director who has uh, released these uh, as his uh, as his uh, freshman efforts right out the gate. Uh, yes. Okay, so these are interesting in that they are a pair of, I, I wouldn't say related, they're sort of thematically related, stylistically related mm. um, movies, but they both deal with kind of a, a steampunky universe and are set in towns where the, the labyrinth of tunnels and mines and cisterns and caverns that underlie all large cities are a major plot point. Um, the, the first movie, Kura Yukaba, uh, is loosely based around a private detective whose father disappeared into the underworld or the underground while investigating some disappearances. You know, naturally, this is like a big childhood trauma for him, uh, but it didn't present, prevent him from becoming a private investigator himself. And unfortunately, he's fallen on hard times. He's drawn back into investigating the same kind, the same circumstances that that caused his father to disappear. As he digs into it more and more, he gradually discovers more and more information about the surprisingly um, diverse and far-ranging um, goings-on in the uh, underworld. Uh, I'm not sure how much more we should say about, about it with, with spoilers, but it's kind of a, a steampunky kind of universe. Everything in this is, uh, is full of like earth tones. It's got a, a very muted palette. Everything is brown or, or sort of wooden or that tarnished brass look you get with steampunk. People have sort of gratuitous goggles on and nifty little gear work gadgets. Part of the, uh, the plot of this is that it involves subway lines that were built decades ago and then either abandoned or taken over by a, by a crime family mm. so you you wind up with the police charging into the subway tunnels with their police train kind of like uh dominion tank police yeah. uh to to deal with the uh with the criminal organization yeah. that has sort of ramified and taken control of areas of the commuter tunnels that, that don't get used very much. Yeah, stylistically, this felt kind of like Taisho era to me. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of that period from like the mid 19 teens to 1920s, you know, sandwiched between the Meiji and the Showa eras. Uh, where, um, you know, you've got modernization going on, you've got technology, but you still have a lot of traditional trappings of Japanese mm -hmm. history mis mixed with heavy European influences. Um, and, you know, it could, that could slip a decade or two either way, probably in the Showa direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of out of time. Uh, and very much, you know, as, as you say, stylized in this in this steampunk way. Uh, the yeah. steam isn't so much the uh, the aesthetic as as the mechs who who crop up. They are sort of the main interesting piece of technology. I guess yeah. you've got the trains, but I yeah, mean to ahead. be pedantic about it, you don't really have steam powered technology so much as you just have tons and tons of like small internal combustion engines powering mm. things that realistically would require 10 times as much power yeah. as as the steam as the you know petroleum powered engine could provide so you've got a lot of things that are that are like well this is a small railroad switching engine which is also a ghost in the shell style tachikoma kind of <laughs> 
Yeah, this is very much rule of cool in terms of how the technology mm. works. So you've got, you know, stompy, uh, stompy trains on legs running around, crashing into other trains to knock them off and ferring out uh, uh, shells filled with bird lime, as they say, to uh, sticky substance to yeah, trap I, people. I, I thought that was kind of a cute gimmick. Um, yeah. I, I really enjoyed that in uh, The Incredibles when I first saw it. Uh, there's mm. there's a particular scene where Mr. Incredible is infiltrating the villain's lair and he gets detected. And instead of like, you know, catapulting him into a lava pit or firing machine guns at him, the villain's defense system is it just fires blobs of goop at him. And the problem is it's sticky and it sort of mm. expands like spray insulation. So by the time he gets hit by five or six of these, he's completely engulfed and just suspended inside this ball of, of, of like viscous muck that he can't fight. He can't punch it. He can't break it because it's soft and sticky and he, he just winds up, you know, captured, but in a harmless mechanism, which I, which I thought was like pretty cute. Yeah, so that's in the second movie, the Kudabedo Kagarli, not mm -hmm. in the first one, the, the Kuda Yakuba, or Kuda, uh, Kuda Yukaba. And the first one, I would say, is much more about, you know, straight up firearms and explosives in terms of what the characters are using against each other. So there's lots mm -hmm. of, of running gunfights and people hurling grenades and setting off fireworks and so on. Yeah. Uh, implying there's, you know, actual dangerous stakes going on. The first movie focusing on the private detective is uh, very, very much an unraveling the mystery. Like you pull on a string. Um, this this guy is ostensibly investigating um, a series of missing persons cases, as private investigators in these movies always seem to do. And this leads him to uh, the abandoned subway tunnels and caverns and cisterns and whatnot that underlie his local city. And as he starts exploring the subway tunnels, he discovers that they're not just a, a hangout for like homeless and vagrants and things like that. There's actually a, a gang of, uh, of masked, they call them vigilantes in some of the promo material, but they just seem like a gang mm. called the, what the laughing masks, because they wear these sort of armored helmets with, uh, with sort of like smiley faces on them. And they're like, you know, the mysterious, you know, powers behind the, uh, the underworld, except that the more he investigates, it turns out that, well, there's a power behind them. And the more he investigates that, he determines that there's a power behind them. And at some point you find out that it's not just the, the private investigator who's taking an interest in this, the authorities are actually taking seriously this whole missing persons thing because it's a lot uh, more widespread and a lot uh, longer lasting than the scuttlebutt of his private clients has indicated. And this is where the, the police train and it's, it's kind of like a Lupin movie where at a certain point, Zenigata just shows up with like, you know, 23 paddy wagons full of Interpol police and uh, and the party is over. Um, there, there's also this uh, almost mythic depth that they uh, that the uh, author is giving this through the writing. So it's not, you know, the underground. It's not like the subway. It's the dark you know, mm -hmm. capitalized in the, in the subtitles. And that's very much how it feels, right? It's, it's not something that can be directly compassed by understanding it. It's weird. It's strange. It's got kind of that, you know, David Lynchian dream world underground feel, not quite that far, but you know, it's, it's, it's like, there's always going to be another layer to that onion. And the deeper you go, the more you peel, the more dangerous it's going to be for you. Yeah, and I, I think that's actually a, a sort of an overlying or underlying theme for yeah. both of these movies is the the sort of idea that everything is 
just layer upon layer upon layer. Um, and one of the metaphors for this is that there are subsidences, there are sinkholes. Um, just it, it seems like all of these stories are sort of like led into through a sinkhole opening in some unusual place or somebody causing a sinkhole to appear or just the town is plagued by sinkholes where your ordinary everyday reality is suddenly just giving way and you realize there's this darker hidden labyrinth underneath of everything that goes on in the regular world and that's that's sort of the the entree into into the story for for both of these movies and uh it's kind of interesting how the the sinkholes are are meant to be these these metaphors for like how society functions it's like well did you know that when they build subway tunnels um in the olden days they didn't have like you know subterranean boring machines where they would just you know sink a shaft into the ground and then start digging out a subway tunnel they just dug this big huge trench put a subway at the bottom of it reinforced the roof and then filled it back in with dirt so that if you look at the city map afterwards there's the city there's the city and then all of a sudden there's this like big long line of brand new buildings that flow like a river through the old city and it's like well that's where they destroyed everything to build the subway tunnel and then once they filled it in of course people started rebuilding on top of it mm. and uh it's it's a it's a very interesting insight there's there's things like um you know why is this street here particularly and it's like well there used to be a river here but everyone started throwing sewage into it because that was the only way to get rid of it in olden times. So to cover up the stench, they basically just fenced, they just like built a tunnel over top of the, uh, of the river. So now there's a street where the river used to be, and the river is now sort of like the, the backbone of, of the modern sewer system. Uh, all of these things, you know, you've, you've talked to people who have to schlep around um, in the utility tunnels under the city. They are just this nonsensical, antique hodgepodge of, you know, expedient spaces and forgotten things and, you know, subway lines that were supposed to go from here to there and then the funding fell through. So they're like half completed or worse yet, wholly completed, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, like never used. So you, you can come across strange and interesting things in the, you know, utilitarian underspaces of a big city. And that's sort of like, I think, the conceit that the makers of, of both of these movies were all about is that there's always... You know, even in real life, there's this stuff under, you know, almost every city and even town that that we live in. There's there's water pipes, there's power lines, there's Lord knows what else, you know, underneath the ground, and the they're mostly forgotten about unless you're one of the one of the guys who has to go down there and maintain things. Um, and this is again in the second movie very explicitly referenced because the whole city it feels like is is built on this gigantic uh vertical um hierarchy where at the top you've got this i don't want to say golden but clean and tall and and smooth office building where you know the the all powerful corporation has its offices and then below that you've got their various you know normal townsfolk you've got union leaders mine owners merchants bankers all that sort of stuff and then below them you've got sort of the lower town where the coal miners live and then underneath the streets you've got the coal mines 
and the unmapped natural caverns and this and that. And one of the big plot points of the second movie, um, Kura Meru Kagari, is that you're following a map maker, this girl who works for a librarian or information broker, and she is just inquisitive and she crawls around in these tunnels and caverns underneath their city, mapping them out because, you know, they've been there forever and nobody knows what they are. Or more sinisterly, the people who put them there don't want anyone else to know that they're there um, because they have their own nefarious uh, political objectives to advance. So they don't want people mapping them out. And that's her job is to just sort of wander around, you know, following her intuition and mapping out things to provide this, uh, as it turns out, pretty significant tactical information for all of the various factions in the town, which are busily engaged in building tunnels, causing some silences under their rivals and jockeying for an enhanced position in the town so they can be higher up in the hierarchy, aspiring towards that gleaming skyscraper of ultimate power. And it's worth noting that each of these movies is barely over 60 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. They are super close to an hour each. And these are very ambitious uh, pieces of world building and story and introducing characters that they're trying to fit into these, you know, con self-contained uh, pieces of, uh, of, of filmmaking. And it largely works, I'd say. Um, you know, the first one is, I think, a little more coherent than the second one, which is a little overstuffed in terms of the number of characters. But in each case, you know, there's certain threads, you know, they, it, it's almost more about vibes than about the specifics. You know, there's story, there's characters, there's plot, but it's much more, I think, you know, getting back to what you said at the start there, Matt, about theme. Right. It's more about the idea of, you know, spaces underneath the city uh, filtered through these uh, these these grungy, um, these grungy uh, futuristic past uh, aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and I'm glad that you brought that up because that was one of my chief complaints about both of these. I mean. Um, I, I read that these were like crowd uh, funded things and they're original movies, not adaptations of a of a manga or a light novel or God help us, a multimedia yeah. video game property. These are original things and uh, I don't want to be too harsh on them because it's honestly miraculous that these exist at all and they're they're pretty well executed, but I I remember like, getting about halfway through the first one of these movies and going, God, I wish that they would like slow down with, mm. with all of this exposition and plot development, because the, you're right. This is like a 61 minute movie. And honestly, it could stand to be 105 minutes long, maybe maybe yeah, for sure. two hours because you're just not able to get, as much characterization and personality for your, uh, for your main characters, you, you tend to fall back on, on expository techniques. Like there's the, the like creepy puppet show a la Utena where these, uh, just like sort of retro steampunk puppets show up and they dump a lot of exposition on you about what's going on. And it's it's pretty hard to assimilate all of this yeah. stuff because you're continually getting exposition. I, I mean, we bashed on movies in the past where they were so miserly with their exposition that you you barely can figure out what's going on and should anything be going on. 
Whereas in this one, that's like, they've got lots of cool ideas and they really, really want to share them with you. But it's, it's, it's kind of like listening to a, to, to a hyperactive, you know, 12 year old describe Dragon Ball Z to you uh, because they, they will just talk your ear off. And, and it's just like, could you be, you know, please less more superficial no well yeah and it, you know i i'm with you there but the thing is it also the execution um you know within the constraints balances some of that out right so this isn't mm. like one of these uh fantasy shows that really cares about the politics where they try to dump all the politics on you at the start uh -huh. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's okay. It just, it, you're, it, you're really feeling the constraints that they had to work with. And you see this going into the art as well. So I, I like the designs in this a lot. I mean, I actually yeah, love a lot yeah. of the designs, but overall, I'd say this feels almost like animated concept art. And they've made up a lot of the, the slack through CG. Uh, some tasteful use of CG, some somewhat less tasteful use of CG. Um, I actually didn't mind the CG. There were a lot of cases mm. where I didn't even notice it until later. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd say it gets a pass on CG. Normally I hate CG, but I'm just... I was willing to tolerate it in this case. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's not that bad. And, you know, it's more that you can feel that they could have done better right they did great mm. with what they had available but it's more like you know you just wanted them to have a little more resources to work with to fully realize the vision yeah. and and yeah so so, so I'm, I'm with you i mean I, i'm not dinging this as like i'm a, a, you know a great artistic failure it's more just it, it um some of the stylistic choices they made, you know, about things like the character designs, uh, you know, the the art style and so on, are were, were clearly made to keep the costs down a little bit, right? So by by making a uh, a virtue of necessity. Oh, this is interesting. I'm reading up about the uh, crowdfunding effort behind mm. these productions, and uh, their goal was to raise uh 20 million yen to fund a film at least 40 minutes long so they got mm. two films each of which was just barely over an hour so that's like 120 minutes where they were shooting for like one third of that that's pretty uh, brilliant yeah. so honestly kudos to these guys um for making a lot out of what it sounds like you know a pretty modest funding. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, from a directorial uh, perspective and as well as just like this being, you know, a, a new property, you know, quite often these are a mess, right? So they don't hold together, you know, perfectly as pieces of writing, but as, you know, standalone OVAs, basically, I think these are pretty solid. And I'm mm. really, and, and the vision behind them is, you know, there's, there's a definite unity of aesthetic approach. Uh, I'll, so I'll be very interested to see what else uh, Tsukahara does uh, going forward, for sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that if you like the the sort of like steampunk retro uh turn of the century technology vibe um and you you're like get into like the earthy richness of the palette and also sort of the the sort of like texture overlay that mm. that comes along with this it's kind of like it's either being projected on a on a screen or they're trying to get a uh a sort of like sketchy paper look to everything, which looks nice when it's um, a static shot, but when you start scrolling around, it becomes very noticeable. Hmm. Um, but if you like that, if you like the universe, if you're interested in the characters, um, you might actually get a lot more out of these by like watching these two or three times. So you actually get a chance to to absorb all of the all of the cool exposition they really really want to tell you <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, whether it's something that you, you know, you watch once. It's like, oh yeah, that's that's that was. I'm glad I've seen that. I don't need to do that again. This is what I, I definitely wouldn't mind owning on Blu-ray. Yeah. Mm. Um, it was interesting. Like I said, the animation is pretty good. CG is okay. Um, it's not too bad. Let's put some final words on this. How do we feel about this um, as a recommendation? Well, I'll start. I mean, I like this. I I, I don't think it's going to be for everyone. Uh, this is, um, you know, if you're looking for, you know, perfectly executed uh, mass media entertainment, uh, probably not going to deliver. But if you, you know, like uh, 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 Bacano or some of those sort of jazz age theme anime and are willing to you know, over overlook some of the uh, some of the, the rushed character of these for the the excellent style and the ideas behind it. Uh, I think you'll probably like at least one of these. So I, I'd recommend it if you're an anime fan, and if you're listening to this show at this point, you probably are. Uh, yeah, I'd I'd have to give this credit for a good art style, um, interesting world building. Um, sort of an industrial uh steampunky aesthetic and um the characters are not bad i just wish they they could have um developed them a little more in depth but they're they're perfectly serviceable everything about this is perfectly serviceable um so i'd i'd like recommend this to to people who like steampunky things or just the whole idea of uh, kind of the the unseen layers that that underlie both society and the geography of towns. I think that's mm. a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was definitely um, interesting, and you know, it's it's a recent set of movies. So, oh yeah, these just came out in 2024, like in April. Uh, so these are brand new. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if these are, are even available on Blu-ray yet. Um, I know they're on streaming on uh, Crunchyroll. Yep, yep, that's where we watched them. So, so I got two links for you: oglink.com mm-hmm. slash seventy seven J seventy seven M, as in Mary. Um, Crunchyroll and to the A N N. There was no wiki um, listing on this, surprisingly. Oh well, I hope somebody gets to work on that. They're kind of they're interesting and worth documenting. I'd say. Yeah. I think that was plenty for this week. <laughs> yeah. So for all the things we've mentioned, please visit our website, www.talkgeneration.net or gnetworks.tv. Um, you can always hit us up by email at talk.generation at gmail.com. We've had it the whole time. Um, you can also come and hang out with us in Discord, oglink.com slash Discord. There is a feedback channel, so if you want to leave feedback, you can. Uh, what else? Um, you want to become a patron supporter? oglink.com slash patreon or oglink.com slash support we're going to keep encouraging that which is 35 shows away so that's a bit of time but it's uh, only 35 weeks away so you know guys get on board if you want to keep listening um so ah. with that being said thank you everyone for listening this week um i'm gonna grab what did i do paul i did i did cup last time i'm gonna i'm gonna grab mug All right, you got a slip of paper. Uh, I'm going to grab the one that was dangling because it has less words on the back of it. Any day above ground is a good day. Ah, So, you know, present tense, present tense. And, I mean, you know, this is, you know, sort of grim resignation, which is, you know, not necessarily out of spec for a uh, a fortune, right? I mean, you know, but, but I want something like, your life will suck, boy. You know, some, something along those lines that lets you know this uh, this fortune is watching you. This fortune is not reflecting on the writer's own life that has led them to this point. So I have to say, uh, unfortunately, not even close to a fortune. Um, okay, so thank you, everyone, again. Uh, and until next week, have a good one. See you then. Bye. <laughs>